With anybody here ever live in Illinois, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Anybody here ever live in Wisconsin, raise your hand. See, behind you, yeah. Uh, during football season, the Wisconsin people are more vocal. <laughs> Anyone else in this section? How about over here? The people who don't do live streaming love this part, trying to follow me on the camera. Of course, Sweet Dora's in the very, very corner. Karen Gortmaker from Rapid City for, uh, and her daughter Caitlin Hendrickson and they're going to be with me till Friday. So watch, watch better not get on the road because we're probably out there. Thank you, sweet Dora. At this point, I'll turn to Deb Pearson. Uh, we wanted a special moment today. Deb, go ahead. Good morning. I'm Deb Pearson, part of the worship committee. And although they don't need any introduction, I, do, I am pleased to recognize Pastor Steve and Sue Marshall, who have been an integral part of our church for the past 12 years. Before retiring, Pastor Steve served as an associate pastor. Although he performed the usual duties of an associate pastor, most of you are most familiar with his art sermons, which developed into Sunday mosaic services. There are many drawings throughout the Willowbrook campus uh, that Pastor Steve did, and many of you probably have one in your home as well. Um, Sue found her calling at Willowbrook as a member of United Methodist Women, um, now called United Women in Faith. She served Willowbrook's unit as vice president and president. Sue is pretty much single-handedly responsible for the outstanding programs at UMW and has always ensured that the social justice goals were met. Okay, I think, believe Pastor Steve would like to say a word. Oh. <laughs> now, he said he did. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I did ask if I could say a few words, and I promise that I will keep it under 15 minutes. <laughs> No, I told uh, Deb, I said, I just feel like I need to say thank you. I need to say thank you to this congregation uh, for the opportunity and the privilege and the joy of serving you for 10 years as an associate pastor, uh, for uh, loving Sue and I, and, uh, and we have fond memories of, of, of mosaic and art sermons and all those things. Uh, and we know that you, uh, you enjoyed them as well. Um, I have to tell you that I feel very fortunate to be standing here this morning. Uh, in um, May, I went in for a, I wouldn't say routine, but a hernia repair outpatient. Uh, it didn't wind up being outpatient. Uh, at post-op, I had problems with my heart. They kept me overnight, sent me home. A few days later, I passed out, Sue called 911, I was back in the hospital. They found a pulmonary embolism, a large blood clot that was sitting right on top of both lungs and was affecting my heart. And so the next day they went in and they did a, a risky, from what I understand, uh, heart catheterization where they went through the heart to, uh, to deal with the uh, embolism. And uh, we were told later, I'm glad they didn't tell me then, they told me later, not many people survive that kind of thing. So I'm very glad to be here. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your prayers. I know you were, I know you've been praying for us because I, I've seen the prayer chain and I know. Um, and then the other thing is, I'm just hoping to get stronger enough and well enough so that I can take on my new duties July 1st as pastor of Community Church of Buckeye. But uh, thank you for your support. I'll <laughs> cry. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Deb. I just want to say, when I first joined Will, don't go away, don't go away. <laughs> when I first joined Willowbrook, Pastor Steve rotated Sabbath and Sunday services like our pastors do today. 
Steve would occasionally reminisce to past years and would have the congregation pass the peace by joining hands and singing, Let's Be the Tithe That Binds. Um, I'd like everybody, if you're able, to stand and join in singing, Let's Be the Tithe That Binds. wish you the best of luck and the congregation is invited to join us in fellowship hall to personally uh, greet and thank pastor steve for his service and there will be brownies we've discovered uh, one of pastor steve's personal favorites thank you so today is Father's Day, I'd like to invite Marilyn Burmeister up as she has prepared four bags that I'm going to give away to four lucky fathers. Um, the First, I'm going to give you guys I didn't know you were going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always ready to talk. <laughs> this is a very special bag, Gary, for you. Thank you. A couple, maybe a month or so ago, he kind of whined to me and said, you know, I've always been in the conference and I've never gotten a bag. So this year I made him a special Father's Day bag. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you so much. Okay, this one's mine. Yep. See, I rigged the question so that I would win. Now I don't have to do that. <laughs> the first bag is for... I know that... Many men play important roles in the lives of children. Some are fathers and some are not fathers. And, and the first bag goes to um, any, let's say, um, any father in the room, when we have, in, here's the category, any father in the room who coached a team um, that did, that where his child was not on that team a baseball team, soccer team, whatever. Uh, is there a father in the room who coached a team for other people's kids? Would you raise your hand? One back here, two, okay. Three, four, Three, four? that takes care of our bags. <laughs> Dick. No, I got one last night. Oh, you got one last night? Okay, where were the other hands? Uh, Mr. Dodd, what did you coach? Baseball and basketball. Would you pass that down? Who was the other one? And was there another one? No, was there one? Oh, Dave back there. Okay, was there another? You got yours, you got yours. Dave, what did you coach? Oh, he's busy talking. What did, what did you coach? Basketball. Basketball. Dave, what did you coach? Soccer. Soccer. When I was in seminary, I coached a little league team, thinking that baseball would be fun. Parents of little league kids are not fun. <laughs> Next category. Oldest father in the room. Oldest father, if you are a father in the room and you're in your 80s, raise your hand. If you're a father in your room and you're in your 90s, continue to keep your hand up. We have two. If you're, okay, 91, keep your hand up. 92, hand still up. 93. Okay, 
93 in one month. In anybody, you're not 92, you're both 91, right? Both 92. You're both 92. 92 and five months. When are your birthdays? July. March. So it would be July 7th. July is more than March. <laughs> January, February, March, April, May, June, July. March is older because it happened first. Who's March? March. Oh, plus you already got one, right? Yeah, okay, we're all good here. We're all good here. I, I do want to share, as I'm not doing the the prayer sequence, I do want to share that we were saddened this week to hear of two people and beloved people in our congregation who passed away. One being a friend of our families, Roger Emerson, who passed away, and also Bobby Wold. Um, many of you know from Royal Oaks, Bobby Wold passed away. And so we will miss both of them. Let us continue in worship. Please join us for the call to worship. It's a responsive reading found in your worship bulletin. When forces in the world threaten us, when our bodies or spirits turn against us, there is one who seeks us, one who meets us, one who heals us, whose love washes over us, and sets us free for joy. This one is the Lord. Come, let us worship God. Our song of praise is number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
join me in the unison prayer printed in your bulletin. Holy One, God Most High, grant us faith to confess our sins and seek your mercy. There are barren places in our lives where we have wandered far from you. We have listened to voices who distracted us from your call. Deliver us from evil. Let us enter into your kingdom. Then send us out to serve you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now is our time for prayer. Um, it says in your bulletin that Jim Becker and Bobby Wold are in the hospital. Both have been released. Uh, Jim is at home, probably sleeping in his recliner. And Bobby is in God's loving arms. The white rose on our altar today represents love and sympathy to the family and friends on the death of Donna Lisa's daughter, Dawn Webb, on June 11th. Ellen Kendig's brother, Norman Arthurs, on June 11th, and Roger Emerson on June 14th. Uh, services information is pending. As we come into this time of prayer, I know that each of us have things on our hearts and in our minds that, that we want to bring before God. So we'll begin with a time of silence. Then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer, and we will say together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, we are humbled when we come before you. We come with so many little things. They're big in our world, but they're little. And you, Lord God, created the entire world and everything in it. We are humbled and amazed that, that you've done this for us. We thank you for the sunshine, for our homes where we live, for this church where we can gather. We thank you for the friends and family in our lives. And Lord, we just thank you for this blessing of Father's Day when we can remember the people who were important to us in our lives, the men who've guided us. And Lord, we give you thanks for them. Lord, we ask you to bless our children, our grandchildren, our friends, and our family, that you keep them safe and healthy. Lord, this COVID thing continues to grow and to spread, and we don't understand it. We think it should be gone, but Lord, it's still here. So we ask you to help contain it, to help the people who study, to understand, and Lord, for this to be removed for it to be safe again to gather, to shop, to do the things we'd like to do. Lord, hear our prayer. We lift up prayers for those who serve in the military, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and the Coast Guard, whether they're stationed in this country or around the world. Lord, we pray that you be with them and keep them safe and bring them home to their families. And Lord, we remember the first responders, the policemen and the firemen and the paramedics, those who serve in our communities. And we lift them up to you and pray for their safety. Lord, we really pray for the safety of everyone everywhere. It seems no matter where we go, there can be danger. There's danger in schools, in movie theaters, in malls, in walking in a park. So Lord, we just pray for saner minds to prevail, for safety for all. Lord, we just lift those who are suffering up to you. Those who are grieving the deaths of family members, we lift them up to you. Lord, may you provide them the comfort and the peace that goes beyond all understanding. Lord, we thank you that this world is in your control because we don't understand. We thank you that you love us all the time. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and the difference he makes in our lives. We thank you for your spirit that guides us and helps us. Lord, it, let hear us as we pray together the words that Jesus taught his disciples when they came and said, Lord, teach us how to pray 
he taught them these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I've, I've said this several times, and, and that this is my favorite time of worship, when we have an opportunity to give something back to our Lord God who has given us everything. And I just pray that you will be generous, and as time progresses, when you're writing your checks or making your donations, you remember what Jesus said, or what, yeah, Jesus, Gary, said <laughs> about the air conditioners and and we all enjoy the cool, so let us help contribute to that too. May the ushers wait upon us to receive our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
Lord God, thank you for this opportunity to give back to you. We pray that you take these gifts, these tithes, and these offerings, that you multiply them and use them to fulfill your kingdom here on earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. And a little bit of the backstory. So Elijah, the prophet Elijah, is having a showdown with King Ahab about whose God is supreme. And this is where they, um, the 450 prophets of Baal challenge our the God of Israel, and um, turns out that the God of Israel wins, and all the 450 prophets of Baal have been eliminated. So this is where this passage starts in. When King Ahab got home, he told Queen Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Elijah was afraid, and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servants there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me. So the Lord responded, Go out and stand before me on the mountain. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake either. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, go back the same way you came and travel in the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be king of Aram. This is the word of the Lord. Our song of preparation is number 507, Through It All.
Let's pray. Loving God, we have over the past few weeks been looking to learn a little bit more about how the Holy Spirit works. Our prayer today is that you would continue to teach us. Be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. This is one of those Sundays where there's a lot going on. Today is Juneteenth, which is the, the recognition of the fact that after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, that some in the Deep South still held, held slaves and did not give them their freedom. It was up to three years after Lincoln signed that proclamation that the, the American government had to send troops into the last place was Texas, and into Texas and, and to ensure that all slaves were free. And in the delight of that moment, uh, June 19th has been designated as the beginning point of freedom for so many in this country. So today we remember that. We remember our, our study over the last few Sundays and the focus on the Holy Spirit. And we have been learning how God speaks to us in that still, small voice. If you look at your bulletin cover, that's the phrase that's pulled out from Scripture today, that even when things are busy and loud and so forth, we hear God, or we learn to hear God in a still, small voice. Today is also Father's Day, which means for us that we are busy with, with so much. And, and today I want us to also to remember that Jesus pointed to his heavenly Father. And we've looked in the last couple of weeks about Jesus in praying to his Father, and then asking his Father to send the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God might be with us, even when Jesus returned to heaven and was with the Heavenly Father. The Spirit of God, an extension of the Heavenly Father, is with us. I, I want to share one more thing, too, and that is, as, as I look out over the congregation, I, I, I see people, I, I see just in one glance, um, women who have served as pastors' wives and retired pastors. And so we're gonna do something in this church that I think will be fun. Today we focus on, on Steve and Sue, and I told Steve before the service, are you ready for Steve Marshall Day? And Steve said, I hope it's not that. <laughs> but we would have had donuts today, except that Steve likes brownies better. So we're having brownies today, yay. On July 10th, which is a Sunday, we're gonna do something just for fun. Right after the service, um, because a lot of times people think all the fun stuff happens during the the rest of the year, during the summer when it's hot, we don't do fun things anymore. Well, we're gonna change that. On July 10th, Jim Dodd and some of, his, some of his friends are gonna make breakfast. You'll have to sign up for this, but right after church, we're gonna have a free breakfast where we're gonna go into the fellowship hall and have breakfast together for free that you have to sign up for so we know how much food to get and we are going to celebrate retired pastors, retired pastors' wives that are among us. And as in the office, we've been working down our list. That list is getting bigger and bigger of people who are part of us that, that at some point were a retired, or at some point were a pastor's wife, or at some point were a pastor. So write that day down, July 10th. Fun time, breakfast at church. 
uh, honoring those who have served. I mean, like Pastor Lois is a retired pastor. We just hired her out of retirement because she was too good to be just retired. <laughs> so today, we're covering a lot of ground. So I better get started. There was once a young pastor who was assigned to a church in Oklahoma, a rural congregation. And so he, he arrived in town on a Monday and he thought, well, I, I need to go out and meet my congregation. So he got a list of the people who were listed as church members and he went to visit every single one of them, whether they were on a farm or in town or um, out in the countryside, he went and visited every single family that was listed on a list at the church as being a part of the congregation. And he met them and invited them to church. Well, on Sunday, he was pretty excited. He had a sermon ready to go, and, and there were three people. No one showed up. All those people that he met and had tea with and sat in their living rooms, None of them showed up. So this is what he did. He went to the local newspaper and he put an ad in the paper. Such and such church, that church, is a dead church. Come Sunday afternoon for a special service where we will lay to rest a dead congregation. Needless to say, that article got some attention. And church that next Sunday was full. And this is what the pastor did. As people arrived, they noticed in front of the church, there was a coffin. And he had flowers on top. And the pastor led the first part of the worship like he would normally. And then instead of a sermon, he began his eulogy on the dead church. And then he said, in the midst of his eulogy, I, I, I think you need to come and, and pay your respects to the dead church. So he instructed the ushers to open the coffin there in front and invited people to come down the center aisle pay their respects to the dead church and then return to their seats. People came down the center aisle and what the pastor had done is strategically place a mirror in the coffin <laughs> that as the people looked into the coffin, they saw a reflection of themselves. And with this, the pastor was saying, the dead church, are the dead people, the people who have given up their faith. Now, may, maybe that seems drastic, but I, I'm sure there was real communication uh, in that Oklahoma town. And what we are striving to understand with the use of the red colors of Pentecost, as, as you will know that normally we just use these on Pentecost Sunday when we celebrate the church receiving the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised, and the birth of the church and all that the church represents. Then we change colors and go on to the next thing, but uh, Pastor Lois suggested uh, in staff, let's stay red for a while. Let's focus on Pentecost, on the church, that the church is not dead any longer, that with the Holy Spirit, the church is alive. Let me now transition uh, from that, holding that in mind, but I want to say something about Father's Day. All of you fathers parented differently. And I say that because even within my own family, my mother and my father parented differently. My mother was one that if we misbehaved, had no reservation about giving us a swat, a spanking, I know that experience all too well. <laughs> My father, on the other hand, parented differently. 
And he taught us love and respect and taught us that when we misbehaved, when we did something wrong, we were letting him down. And I remember as a little kid doing something, I don't remember what I did, but I remember I was sent to my room and actually sent to my parents' room and I was in there pouting and crying and, and my dad came in to talk to me and I said, get out of here. <laughs> and I felt, I felt so bad because my dad was just a, a, just a wonderful, loving guy and a, and a perfect father. And after I kicked him out of the room, I felt so bad that, and that I think he accomplished what he had hoped for, that I was remorseful for what I did. And I didn't want to ever do that to my father again. In scripture, we are taught. We are taught to refer to God as Abba Father. And Abba Father means Daddy. That God, our Heavenly Father, we can refer to as Daddy. Though God is great and, and powerful and, and, and loving and, and there for us. There for us in a way that I think we don't always comprehend because we don't stop and understand that. In the same way that I didn't want to disappoint my father anymore. That we, when we come to know the forgiveness and love of God, then, then God is daddy. There, there was a, a Scottish Christian successful businessman. And this man was a, a large man, a barrel chested guy, stood with a, broad shoulders, and always stood with great posture. This Scottish Christian successful businessman um, had a joyful countenance about him, and one who loved life, and one who lived a life that was respected by others. He raised a family. He raised his kids. Uh, among his kids was one boy who had been taught by his father, faith, respect, education, work ethic, treating people right. And this young man was a lot like his dad, not quite as big, not quite as large, not quite as barrel chested, a, a younger man that, that was well dressed and educated. And in his first job was quite successful then it was discovered that in his first job, he embezzled funds from the company that hired him. Charges were brought against him. A trial was set and he went to court. And there in the court was this young man, well-dressed, uh, well-versed in everything he said, who approached the trial sort of nonchalant, uh, sort of acting like, well, I'm confident in myself. Whatever happens here, I'm going to get through it and I'm going to get by and I'm going to be successful. And so this young man had this nonchalant attitude in court when the judge finally got to that point where he said, will you please rise for your sentencing? And the young man stood up to receive his sentence, looking at the judge but with his peripheral vision, he saw that somebody else in the room had stood up. And he looked over at his lawyer's table and his father, who had been sitting with the lawyer throughout the whole trial, his father stood up. And this man who always stood with great posture and, and uh, straight shoulders, on this occasion stood with his son to receive the sentence along with his son. But this time his shoulders were rounded and his head was bowed. And there were tears coming down his cheek. For this young man, the sight of his father with a 
lowered, bowed countenance was more than he could bear. For he felt that he had disappointed his father. He had not done in business what his father taught him to do. And this young man standing before the judge, the judge could not even speak because the young man started to cry. And he started to, to uh, weep bitterly because his focus was on the sight of his father standing with him. Brothers and sisters, as we reflect on Father's Day about the love of fathers, we reflect more so on the presence of the Holy Spirit with us, the presence of God with us, that, that through our lives, where we find that we make mistakes, do things wrong, that God always stands with us. And we have no greater example of that than in the story of Elijah, which Lori read for you. Elijah, a prominent prophet, stood up against all the enemies of his God. And, and I encourage you to read 1 Kings 18 for the drama of the showdown between God and the false god Baal, the god that most of the people were worshiping, the god that King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were worshiping. This showdown was an incredible story of, of how Elijah, Elijah stood for God against incredible odds and was the present prophet when God prevailed. It's what happens next that draws my attention this day. For Elijah had just been the center point of standing up for God in an incredible way. First Kings 18, read it. And then, after this victory, he receives word that the evil queen Jezebel had sent him a message that she was so upset that her prophets of Baal um, had been put to death that she sent a message to Elijah saying, so help me that no matter what happens to me, uh, what happened to them will happen to you within 24 hours. And Elijah, uh, Elijah received this threat from Jezebel that she would see to it that he would die in 24 hours. Elijah just had the victory over 400 prophets of Baal, over all the people of Israel who were uh, on the fence as to whether they believed in God or a Baal. And with this great experience where God prevailed with fire from heaven and, and th that you need to read about, um, Elijah then receives one threat from one person, though it be a powerful person, and he is fearful. And where God said to him, Elijah, the next step is now to go over there. Elijah then says, no, I'm going to go over there. And he just ran away from Jezebel as far as he could. He, he, he traveled a day and then he traveled into the wilderness and found himself at Mount Sinai and in a cave. And what happens in the interaction between God and Elijah speaks to us. You know why it speaks to us? Because there are some days that we're like that Scottish uh, Christian successful businessman's son because we do things that we know better. We do things differently sometimes than what our parents taught us in teaching us right and wrong. We make mistakes. We sin. And sometimes we're like him. And sometimes we're like Elijah, who trusted God, stood for God, spoke for God, uh, proclaimed 
to all the people about God. And then in the next moment, after a full day of serving God, the story ends that part of what God sent him to do, the next assignment was he traveled 16 miles after, after standing up against the prophets, after being the, the prophet victorious by God, uh, after all of that, then the scripture says he ran 16 miles to his, the next place he was supposed to be. And then he hears the threat and he is fearful and, and does not listen to God anymore. God said, go that way. And he went this way. In the cave, God was patient. In scripture, it says that while he was in the cave, there was a tremendous blowing of wind. Like maybe you would think God would be in the wind. The wind was blowing really hard and, and scripture says, but God was not in the wind. And then there was an earthquake. And the, and the rocks uh, were, were shattering and breaking. And, and, and many people say, in the midst of an earthquake, surely God would be there. And scripture said, no, God was not in the earthquake. And then there was fire that appeared. And, and people would say, oh, surely God would appear in the fire because we look for the dramatic for where God would appear. And then there was silence. And in that silence, a still, small voice. The voice of the Holy Spirit that we're trying to train ourselves to listen to. There was a still, small voice where Elijah heard the word of God. Elijah, why are we here in this cave? The patience of God. Elijah had, had stood for God and then he ran away in fear. He had disappointed God. He had, he had done wrong. And God's patience was not, Elijah, you're a terrible person. You're a sinner. It was, Elijah, why are we here? Why are we here? God and Elijah together. And Elijah said, well, I'm the only one left. Uh, all the other people have turned away. Blah, 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 blah. And then God said to him, you're not the only one. God shows him in the verses that follow, there are 7,000 others. You're not the only one. You need to leave this place and go over there where I called you. And they had to go through that a couple of times where Elijah just had to give his speech. But I'm the only one. The others have given up. Um, others have been put to death and, and they're out to get me. And finally, the Lord just says, let's go. And they went together. For us, brothers and sisters, that's us. That's us. Because sometimes we're saying, yes, Lord, I'm faithfully yours. Uh, I go visit people. I, I go help people who are less fortunate. Uh, I serve through the church. And then we have our moments. And then we have our moments where all of a sudden we're not listening to God. And God is good. God is patient. God says to us, let's go together. Let's go get back on track. Abba Father, Daddy, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with us in our strong moments. Thank you for being with us in our weak moments. And it's always you saying, let's go together. Thanks be the, to the Lord. Amen.
Pastor Steve, you and Sue are dismissed to go get ready to host your party. I want to share with you that if you feel the need for some personal, individual prayer, uh, Jenny McLean, one of our Stephen ministers, will be in the prayer room, which is out the center door, all the way to the left. She will be there to meet anybody who would like to have some personal prayer. I, I want to share with you, too, that Richard Condit, uh, Condit, one of our members of our church, is in the hospital um, with some stomach issues, and so I ask you to be in prayer for him. So that's why the whole word, Woodward Row is not here today. So we'll keep them, keep them in prayer. In Galatians 6, it says this, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. So scripture is reminding us that, that sometimes life is hard and we do get tired. We do dis get discouraged and we do sometimes give up. It's saying, don't give up. Hold fast to what God has for you and receive the blessings that God has for you. Go in peace, knowing that we don't go alone. Go in peace, knowing that even when we make mistakes, God is with us to say, why are we here? Let's go over there instead. Happy Father's Day. Amen. Amen.